Today is the first day of uh, the last full month of the Coptic church calendar. It used to be, of course, the secular calendar in the Coptic period in Egypt, but um, for hundreds of years now, um, when Egypt has adopted the modern calendar, it has become simply a church calendar, an ecclesiastical calendar of months uh, that also uh, governs when we celebrate various occasions in the church. And so the, the, this Coptic calendar is composed of 12 months of 30 days each, and then there's a last month that is five or six days, uh, it's called the small month, depending on whether it's a leap year or a regular year. So today is the first day of the month that we call Misra in Arabic or Misori in Coptic. And this month has a sort of double theme. It is um, intimately intertwined in Coptic religious culture with the Virgin Mary. Today is the first day of the fast dedicated to the Holy Virgin Mary in the Coptic Church. And this goes back to a variety of traditions that coexisted in the early uh, Middle Ages, going all the way back to uh, Justinian the Emperor and the building of a number of churches in Jerusalem at the time, in the 6th century, um, in honor of the Virgin Mary. Eventually, uh, in the Byzantine East, the day of the 15th of August became associated with the repose of the Holy Virgin Mary what is called the Feast of the Dormition, or the falling asleep of the Holy Virgin. In the Coptic Church, this tradition is somewhat more complicated, because already in the 5th century, since Pope Theophilus, we have homilies in Coptic attesting to a date, a different date, for the departure or the falling asleep of the Virgin, and that is the 21st of the Coptic month called Tuba, which is at the end of January, shortly after the Nativity Feast. And so in January was the act was, according to the Coptic tradition, uh, was the departure or falling asleep of the Holy Virgin Mary. And when you read the Synaxarion entries for the 21st of Tuba and on um, in, in, in Misra, the feast in Misra that I'll talk about now, uh, you'll get the kind of complete picture of what it is that the Coptic Church believes took place. Uh, it is that the Virgin Mary fell asleep. Uh, departed to the Lord on, in, in Tuba, the 21st of Tuba. Um, the disciples were gathered at the time around her because they were informed of this beforehand, except for the Apostle Thomas, who was at the time preaching in India. And on his return back from India, he saw a vision in which angels were carrying the body of the Holy Virgin Mary to heaven. And when he saw that, he received the girdle that was wrapped around the Virgin Mary in a miraculous sort of vision. So he gets to Israel, to Jerusalem, and this took place after the disciples had already buried the body of the Virgin Mary. But when, the, when he asks to see the body, they go to the tomb and open it, and they find that the body is no longer there. God has taken the body and carried it up to heaven, which is the, the vision that Thomas saw on his way back. And because the disciples were dismayed at no longer having the body of the Holy Virgin with them, they fasted and prayed, again according to Coptic tradition, until uh, the middle of the month of, of Misra that we're in right now, in which the Lord revealed to them once more a vision of the body of the Holy Virgin Mary, affirming to them that her body was taken up to heaven and that it will not, no longer be buried on earth with them. Uh, and so reading these two things together, you get an idea of what it is exactly that we are um, celebrating this month. Uh, these, these two weeks, this fast of the Holy Virgin Mary that culminates in that feast that commemorates the, the declaration, the announcing of the fact that the body of the Virgin Mary was taken up uh, to heaven. Interestingly, in all of these sources, you don't hear anything about a, a church fast in honor of the Virgin. It doesn't say in the Synaxar entries uh, uh, back in those times, in the 13th century, that the church established a fast in honor of the Virgin. And in all of the canonical texts of our church from the time period that talk about the, the, the fasts that Christians follow, such as Lent or the Nativity fast and so forth, none of them mention a fast uh, about the, or dedicated for the Virgin Mary, which tells us that this fast likely developed as an, uh, an outflow of the natural religious piety of the people at the time. That it was not decreed by the church per se,
but that the people out of their love for the Holy Virgin Mary began to fast this fast during this month. And that shows us that our church is indeed a church of the people, the body of Christ. And that it's not just things that we do that are, that are simply decreed from above, as it were, by whether, you know, synods or popes or what have you. But oftentimes our uh, religious expression is a natural outgrowth of our own love for God, for the Virgin Mary, for the saints, and so forth. We start hearing about this fast only by the 13th century in canonical texts of the time. So this long introduction aside, this gospel then serves two themes. It talks about the end of time because it's the end of the Coptic year. And it also uh, has a hidden symbolism attached to the Holy Virgin Mary, whom we often call the true vineyard, the true vineyard. And so in this parable from Luke chapter 20, the Lord is speaking primarily to the Jewish religious leaders of the time. And he is describing this parable, this story about a vineyard whose owner leases to vine dressers to take care of the vineyard for him. And it says that he leaves for a long time and expects them to cultivate the land, grow the vineyard and uh, uh, reap fruit from that vineyard for him. He owns this property and he's just renting it to others to take care of it for him. The Jewish leaders understood immediately that this has to do with them, that this is a symbol of their own role in the among the people of Israel. God uh, 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 sealed two covenants with the people of Israel, one with their patriarch Abraham, told him, if you, if you follow me, if you obey my commandments, the, you, your children will be as the sand of the seashore and as the stars in the sky. And then further on confirmed that covenant with the prophet Moses on Mount Sinai, gave him the commandments, the Ten Commandments that we all know, and gave him several uh, uh, rules and regulations in the book of Leviticus and in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy about how the people of Israel are to worship the Lord. What are the exact rules that govern their relationship to God, their relationship to other people, the people of Israel, their relationship to people outside of the people of Israel, so-called Gentiles, and how they are supposed to live this way until the coming of the Lord. And so it's exactly as having a vineyard, a garden, around which you put a fence. And that is what, how the law functioned for the people of Israel. It was a fence to protect them from attacks from the outside and to govern their relationship to the owner of the vineyard, that is God, their relationship to one another, and their relationship to the rest of the world. And he left them. This is what, when, when God uh, sent them prophets uh, throughout the, the history of the people of Israel, sending prophets to the people of Israel, guiding them, reminding them of the words of the Lord, uh, announcing to them the coming of the Lord that will happen eventually. Essentially leaving humanity, if you think about it this way from a sort of anthropological perspective, leaving humanity to develop, to mature, to learn morality, to learn a natural sense of theology, their understanding of God, and to learn how to function in society towards one another and to even towards outsiders. And this was that period of time from the prophet Moses all the way until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ in the flesh, giving them this period of time, not leaving them, not abandoning them, because God is always with us, but giving them a chance to learn, giving a chance to grow and to mature. And as I said, the Jewish leaders understood immediately that uh, this was directed at them because when he said at the end uh, that the owner of the vineyard will come and will cast out those vine dressers, they said, certainly not. They had understood all along because in several books of the Old Testament, this analogy of the vineyard was very common. In Isaiah the prophet, in the Psalms of David, of which, of course, the Jewish leaders were very familiar. So they immediately recognized that this was about them. Now, time that I've already mentioned so far is an underappreciated gift, especially young people that are hearing this here. Young people have a tendency to want to fast forward throughout their lives. They're, re- they're reaching to pass you know, middle school, high school. I want to grow up and get a driver's license. I want to pass high school and pass college and get a job so I can be independent. And they can't wait for these years to be over. 
But time is a gift not to be squandered and not to be uh, endured impatiently. But is a gift from God to us so that we can work on our salvation. We can work on our um, spiritual life and that we can work on utilizing properly the gifts that God has given us. And this is what this vineyard is all about. Everyone has a gift and a big part of your spiritual life is discovering what are those gifts or gifts that God has given you. Because he will ask you for what have you done throughout this period of time that you've spent on the earth with this gift that he has given you. A lot of times, uh, conversely, some, some, some are not so uh, eager to pass through time, but a lot of times children have a false sense of constancy. I know I was like that when I was a child. I felt that my environment will never change. My parents will never age. My home will never change. We will never move. And yet you get a sense of false sense of stability. But the fundamental thing behind all of this is that, like I said, time is not simply a function of our earthly life, but it is something that is a primary gift and kind of the backdrop for all of the things that we do otherwise in our lives. So it's a fundamental gift to humanity, not simply to be endured or not simply to be counted days and years and so on, but to be used and sanctified and blessed. And that is why the church blesses even time. We speak sometimes of the liturgy of the word in which I'm reading the scriptures and blessing or, or, or uh, speaking about the readings in the sermon. We speak of the liturgy of the Eucharist, that is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. But in Western traditions, and it's not a term that is very common in our, in our tradition, but it's also applicable, we speak of the liturgy of the hours, the liturgy of time. What is the liturgy of time? It is the fact that the church has appointed prayers to be performed that are tied to specific points in time, whether they are hours in the day, we come in the morning and we pray the third hour and the sixth hour and so forth, or whether it is the day of the week, Sunday being this punctuation of the entire week, or whether they are things that happen once a month, like a feast of the Virgin Mary every month, once a year, or even uh, uh, stops in our own lives when the church comes and blesses a child's baptism, his birth, when the church comes and blesses a marriage or even a funeral at the end. This is in a sense the church saying that we acknowledge the passage of time and that the church blesses these stops, this, these points in one's lifetime. Ultimately, the goal here is to, be, to develop an eagerness towards God, an eagerness for the kingdom of heaven, not a place in which time is abrogated necessarily, but a place in which time reaches its fulfillment, its fullness. We speak of the fullness of time, the pleroma to chrono in Greek. And this the fullness of time was reached historically when the Lord Jesus Christ was born in the flesh, but also has its final culmination in the kingdom of heaven. Not to disregard time, but to reach its fulfillment in Christ. You notice that the the, the parable kind of implies that the, the owner of the vineyard left the vineyard for a long time. Of course, this is only from the perspective of the vine dressers. God never leaves his creation. We call him Emmanuel, who is God with us. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And in the Greek, it, it says, skinos and enemin, in us, not simply among us, like with us, but he dwelt in us. So the Lord never leaves his creation, never leaves his vineyard, never leaves his children. And if you're in the midst of tribulation, if you're in the midst of temptation, if you're in the midst of all sorts of timely problems, you can be assured that the Lord is with you. You can be assured that your God's name is Emmanuel. It's not simply something that he does. It is something that he is God with us. But it's also something to remember when you have fallen under temptation. How many times in our relationships, in our homes, uh, children with their parents, parents among themselves, behave as if God is not present, act as if God is no, has no place in this home or has no place in this interaction. It's almost as if we want to be God's ourselves. We invite God into our presence when we want. When we sit at the table and pray over the food, we're inviting him to bless the food. 
When we come to church on Sunday and we pray before the, the gifts on the altar, we are inviting God to come and to do the thing that only He knows how to do. But at times that are inopportune, at times that are not such good times for us, when we're angry, when we are lustful, when we are envious, when we are etc., etc., we don't act as if we want God to be here with us. We completely uh, uh, ignore the fact that He is always everywhere, whether we want to acknowledge that presence or not. One of the things that are very noticeable in this parable is that the difference in mind between the vine dressers and the owners of the vineyard. The owner of the vineyard sends his son thinking he's doing something that will set things straight. They didn't listen to all those guys that I hired to send to them. Okay, if I send them my own son, that will, will, will put everything back in its proper order. The vine dressers will realize their obligation, their duty. They will get back to cultivating the vineyard. They will produce the fruit. Everybody will be happy. And then the difference in mind and perspective of those evil vine dressers. They look at the same act that God does and see it as an opportunity to usurp, to kill the son of the vine dresser, the vine owner, the, vin- the owner of the vineyard, and to do what they want with his inheritance instead. A big part of what we do in the church, in our spiritual lives, is to acquire the mind of God. We fast, we pray, we offer repentance, we are smoothed throughout our whole lives through the fire of temptation and trials that smoothen the roughness that is in our souls. And all of this is to acquire the mind of God. And if we acquire the mind of God, then we acquire also one mind among each other as the body of Christ. One of the prayers that we pray in the liturgy soon says, make us worthy to partake of your holies, that we may become one body and one spirit, and may have a share and inheritance with all the saints who have pleased you since the beginning. And so a big theme of what it is to become Christian, what it is to enter the church, what it is to be part of the body of Christ is to acquire this oneness of mind that St. Paul speaks about in the letter to the Ephesians very prominently. And the Holy Virgin Mary exemplified this oneness of mind with the Lord. From a very young age, she was in the temple worshiping, um, participating in all of the things available to her through the Jewish faith to help her acquire this oneness of mind with the Lord. We call her the pride of our race, meaning the pride of humanity, that all human beings look up to her as the epitome of what it means to acquire this oneness of mind to be always in God's presence. You see, the problem is that the vine dressers didn't understand that the owner of the vineyard is not actually absent. They were not living in God's presence at all times. But the Holy Virgin Mary from a very young age in the temple lived in God's presence. There was not a moment in which she was not aware of the fact that God is with us, that God is with her. And that is why when the angel comes, Archangel Gabriel, and greets her, when he, told, when he tells her, the Lord is with you. O Kyrios metasu. He's not declaring to her something that she doesn't understand or realize. She doesn't, she's not surprised by this declaration. It is simply reaffirming to her something, a reality that she lived her whole life already. And he's telling her, you have lived up until this point every day, knowing that the Lord indeed is with you. And because of this, now you are worthy to carry the Lord in you. See? And so we too look at her example and we call her in one of our hymns, the unaging vineyard whom no one has cultivated. That's not the translation you're used to. So some of the deacons are thinking right now, what hymn is that? But it's, it's a hymn that we sometimes sing in the beginning of the liturgy. Tivo in aloli natir chello. The unaging vineyard, the vineyard that doesn't get old. And is no one cultivated, obviously in reference to the virgin birth, that no one has cultivated that vineyard. And so she's the vineyard because she, she, she abides in the true vineyard who is the Lord Jesus Christ. So she's the central and most essential branch in that vineyard that is the Lord Jesus Christ and that is the church. There's an icon, a Byzantine icon that comes to mind now that is uh, the Lord who is the vineyard. 
the Ampelosi Alithini, and he is basically Jesus Christ, and it's a tree, a vineyard, and his face is in the middle of that tree. And you can think of the, of the central trunk of that tree as the Holy Virgin Mary. And so let us too, just like she did, dedicate our lives in that way. Live knowing that we too have a gift from God that we need to cultivate, that we need to use. Whatever it is that is an essential gift of your personality that God has left in you is what you work on the most. And also realizing that time passes very quickly. Your life passes very quickly. And there's not that much time left, no matter how young or old you are, to cultivate that gift and to always live in God's presence. Always knowing that God is here, God is with us, and that God watches everything that we do. And that he is the owner of the vineyard who will come back to ask for the fruit of the vineyard, the fruits of the Holy Spirit, that is love, charity, meekness, uh, long-suffering, self-control, and so forth. May the Lord always bless us to do this and to live in his presence now and ever and unto the ages of all ages. Amen.